Hi, I'm Chris Monteri here at the EMS 10 2011 Awards, and I'm joined by Tom Boothelay. Hello, sir. You're a friend of the internet with me. This is true. And tell me who you are, where you're from, and doggone it, why you got this award. Okay, so I'm Tom Boothelay. Oh, I'm, I already said that, right? right? Exactly. <laughs> I'm a, a fire captain paramedic with the town of Hilton Head Island Fire and Rescue Division. And I'm also the editor-in-chief of EMS12lead.com. And more recently, the host of the Code Stemmy web series with First Responders Network. Cool. Uh, editor-in-chief mm -hmm. and kind of writer and the guy that does the internet thing. And I mean, you pretty much do it all, right? I mean, you are the one-man show. Well, it, it's a, no, I'm not a really? one-man show. No, I have two oh. associate editors, actually, a very talented associate editors. So uh, David Baumrind and Christopher nice. Watford, who actually started as uh, readers of the blog and regular contributors, are now two uh, very talented associate editors that uh, crank out a lot of top-notch content. So I uh, definitely could not do it without them. And they're also on the EMS 12 Lead podcast with me as well. Very nice. So, oh, you pop. You're in my space now. I'm in your. I'm, I'm infringing on your territory. I mean, just not a little my bit. space as far as Facebook. Uh, we all know you MySpace. own oh, the whatever, pod, the EMS 2.0 well, pod. Keep going. Keep going. Podcasting go. space. <laughs> <laughs> well, but tell me how you kind of got into social media. I mean, where did that? Where did that come from? Why did you want to do it? Well, even even before the advent of what we call now the EMS 2.0 movement, uh, way back in the days of AOL and CompuServe and Netscape Navigator, there were some listservs and national EMS discussion boards. And so way back in those days, with a lot of uh, the people that are now in the EMS 2.0 movement, I had participated in a lot of those online discussions. And then so at a certain point, it, it went from email listservs to online forum boards. And then from there, it sort of just kind of rolled into blogging and podcasting and the things we take for granted nowadays, the, connect the connectedness with things like Facebook and Twitter and Skype and everything like that. It, it, uh, it, it feels like it was kind of a seamless evolution for, to me. Right. Um, so, so I guess I'm showing my age now, but uh, you know, so I, I turned 40 actually in 2011. So. Oh, I turned 40 this year, so oh, congratulations. Yes. Thank you. So how long have you been in EMS then? Uh, well, I've been a paramedic since November of 1995 and okay. full-time in the field uh, with Hilton Head since August of 1997. Wow. So you've been doing this a while. A while, yeah. So what have you seen change in that time from 95 to today as far as our technology to not only diagnose patients but diagnose STEMIs and those type of things? I think there's a lot more transparency in EMS. At least top-performing EMS systems have a lot more commitment to data collection and transparency. And so uh, things like the CARES registry or just monitoring time-sensitive diagnoses like acute STEMI, acute stroke, and cardiac arrest to where EMS systems are now being true custodians of the chain of survival in their communities. And so they know uh, whether or not bystander CPR is being performed and they have public access to fibrillation programs. There's early acquisition of the pre-hospital 12 lead ECG and field activation of the cardiac cath lab or regionalized systems of care for acute STEMI. And then for cardiac arrest, um, op operational best practices like minimally interrupted chest compressions and uh, uh, controlled ventilations and shocking on a two minute cycle and early recognition of STEMI and early induction of mild therapeutic hypothermia and things like that. So we're seeing the shift to where just this attitude that, well, we do the best we can, uh, but we all know they die anyway, right. to communities that have showed it's really possible. Places like uh, Seattle, King County, and uh, Raleigh, Wake County, and Austin, Travis County, and, and Minneapolis, Hennepin County, uh, have been putting out some numbers that really show that it's possible if, if you uh, take your chain of survival seriously and, and realize that every system is perfectly designed to achieve the results that it gets and kind of approach it in, in that kind of a manner. And uh, we're impacting real lives. Sudden cardiac arrest does not it's not always sudden cardiac disease. Sometimes it's our children in our schools. It can be a drowning. There's many, many reasons. That, and so one of the things I'm fond of saying is as we build these uh, systems of care for these time-sensitive diagnoses, we do it for our community, but we are the community. And so, you know, Kelly and I found that out in an extraordinarily personal way in uh, October of 2010 when, mm. when Kelly's daughter experienced a near drowning. So sometimes I can't discuss it without getting emotional. But uh, We've talked about yeah, that before. Right, yeah, right, yeah makes me almost cry, so yeah, don't, don't do that because we're on camera. <laughs> no, yeah, absolutely, yeah. I hear you. I, well, and I love that you're advocating for that because I think that we hear it a lot from nurses and, and physicians, but having somebody in our industry that really cares a lot about this one issue because we, you know, again, I've been a paramedic a long time, a little longer than you, and, you know, back in the day, we just used to, we'd pump and 
we do a lot of drugs and you know back then the, the emphasis was drugs and then the emphasis became the airway and now really we found out it's the compressions and early electricity and making sure that we're doing sure. those things right yeah. so how do you where do you see the next steps for our industry where do you see us going in this one area of our field over the next even five years i mean do you do you foresee something huge and big coming out uh, not huge and, and big. I, I think really we're at the cusp right now because we have some of these top performing EMS systems in the country that, that have shown us what these best practices are. And they're monitoring what they're doing and they're showing their survival rates increasing. Um, but we need to be mindful that really 90, 95% of the rest of the country is still doing it the same old way. They're not measuring anything. Uh, with EMS and, and so there's such tremendous variability in the United States so when we see these emerging systems of care uh, for example the one that we feature in the Coast Emmy web series for uh, South Dakota where they're building a true statewide system of care and, and similar things I mean it's also happened in South Carolina and uh, it's happened in, in uh, Minnesota and there's other places around North Carolina there's places that, that have, uh, have, have really shown a template for other EMS systems to follow but we still have a very long way to go and, and now that most of the PCI, virtually all of the PCI hospitals in the United States, due to the triumph of the Door to Balloon Alliance, have really gotten their houses in order and their Door to Balloon times are routinely, I mean, 90% 90, 90 of the time or greater, certainly under 90 minutes, top performing hospitals more like 60 minutes. So now, now that that has occurred, it's the critical access hospitals, it's the rural hospitals, it's making sure that every patient counts and regardless of where you live, that we have a plan to streamline you to reperfusion. And so I think that's the next step. And so uh, it, it's, not, it's not that the next step is going to, to be so big or so epic, it's that, um, that uh, true progress happens incrementally. And then by the time you get there, uh, from an epidemiological standpoint, it has a real impact on thousands of patients. So how do we get there where we have this vast area of rural America? Yeah. How do we, how do, we do that? I mean, how do we, is it by transmitting EKGs or is it literally by teaching paramedics and even maybe advanced EMTs how to read a 12 lead EKG and recognize a STEMI and, and maybe bypass that local hospital and yeah. move to the next level. Right, well, well it's both. I mean, when, when we had the privilege of uh, talking to the people from the race program in North Carolina or, or Tim Henry from Minneapolis or just kind of discussing with the people in South Dakota, what it, what it turns out is, is, is a, a, a small area that maybe with one PCI hospital and then some feeder hospitals uh, regionalizes a plan for acute STEMI and it turns out that it works and they publish their data and uh, everyone gets really excited and they go to all the conferences and talk about it and then all the neighboring communities go hey that's kind of cool maybe we should try that and, and so it kind of branches out and next thing you know it's a whole region and ne next thing you know it's the whole state and so most of these things occurred in a stepwise process and uh, however AHA Mission Lifeline, it, um, their reason for being is to help educate uh, communities and regions and states to systematize their approach to acute STEMI and, and come up with plans and just kind of um, solve all the political boundaries or, or, or barriers that there are that, that prevent these systems from forming. But, but there's no need to in, reinvent the wheel uh, right. because the similar problems have been overcome elsewhere. And, and so um, I, I, I think it's going to happen. I think we will see it. It may not be next year or the year after, but I, hopefully one day, it, uh, wherever you are in the United States, uh, with a 911 call, you can be guaranteed that uh, for your acute STEMI or heart attack, you will receive evidence-based care, whether thrombolytics or, or primary PCI or some combination for your heart attack. I'm going to shift gears on you. Sure. Let's talk about social media. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about um, your passion, okay. which is blogging. Yeah. Uh, how did you start? Besides the internet piece. Well, and you sure. Were, well, I, mean, what, well, I mean, what was your... Tell me, do you remember the day you I know first exactly. started blogging? I know exactly right. how, it's, how it happened. See, I, I, had, um, I had been teaching acute coronary syndromes and 12 lead ECG interpretation uh, around the country in various critical care transport programs, and this is the CCEMTP program right. out of UMBC. And so I had realized um, from teaching some very smart uh, nurses and paramedics around the country that there was a little bit of a, a uh, education gap. And, and, and from teaching it so often, I, I had a pretty good grasp of what they already knew and, and some of the blanks that I could fill in. And one of those things is access determination. And we discussed earlier about forum boards and things like that. And I was, I was trying to explain the topic and someone's like, well, I still don't understand. And it, well, I have all these PowerPoints that I used to teach around. I'm like, man, I wish there was a place where I could post these pictures <laughs> online to help me understand. The internet. Right. <laughs> they, my God, it's brilliant. You know? 
So I wrote this uh, six-part tutorial on access determination with the idea that all I was going to do with it is post it at the, it was actually the EMS Village. And, uh, I, oh, yeah, and, I, and, I, and I posted it, and all of a sudden I was getting, I could tell I was getting, a lot of people were reading it, they were leaving comments and things like that. So I'm like, well, I wish there was a way to figure out if, you know, who these people are that are reading it. And so I, I uh, put stat counter on there, and I was like, I couldn't believe it. People from all over the world. Nice. Uh, we're reading this thing, and it was I was only in, into a week into it. So it, it would, I never intended to have a blog. I, I intended to explain to an individual how, how to do, uh, you know, calculate the frontal plane axis on a 12 lead ECG. Um, but I, I, I guess I found it so gratifying that I had a new way to educate um, that I said, well, heck, I'm going to I'm going to keep doing it. And, is, that, uh, is that all you write about now? Oh, no. Uh, no, not at all. Uh, now, um, you know, EMS12lead.com now, it's not just about education, it's also an advocacy blog. So mm -hmm. the regionalized system of care for acute STEMI and, and these best practices that we've discussed, it's mostly education. I try and stay out of politics. Every once in a while I'll right. jump in the foray, but, but first and foremost it's for the education and for the advocacy um, for, for cardiovascular care. Um, and of course, uh, Christopher and David also bring their their own approach to it. But but another thing that's awesome has been the peer sourcing. You know, we just did this case study that showed a very unusual wide complex tachycardia, and there was a debate kind of brewing. Well, could this be WPW or or not? Well, there was very distinguished people on both sides saying what they thought it was, and we're like, oh great, you know, we don't want to offend anybody. Well, it turns out that there are electrophysiologists. Who also have a blog, and so we just kind of send it out to the electrophysiology fellow blog, and uh, we sent it out to uh, Dr. Wes's blog, and uh, we sent it out to Dr. John M. We sent it out to three different electrophysiologists, and they all came back. Yes, it's an accessory pathway. We're positive, and they even told us where the pathway was was located. Holy cow! And so by by being able to now share, because there's so many other bloggers and things with so many areas of expertise, that peer sor sourcing has just been incredible. So I always say no one's learned more from EMS12lead.com than I have. So that's awesome. Yeah, it's been a, a labor of love, so to speak. So where do you see that piece of your your passion really going in the next five years? I mean, we've, we've talked about the, but how do you how do you see this maturing over the written word and now a podcast? Where, where do you want right. to go with it? Well, um, I think the coolest thing that I've been, one of the very coolest things I've ever been involved with is the Code STEMI web series um, with Setla Films and First Responders Network. Um, I, I feel like that's kind of cutting edge right now for social media. Just um, um, video content with exceptional production values and letting EMS folks tell their own personal stories in their own words. Nice. So, so um, you know, I think we were all uh, kind of appalled by the trauma show on NBC that no, came out, yeah. and, and rightfully so. Right. And, and so we don't need to make up stories for EMS because our stories are amazing just the way that they are. And so to be able to, to talk to these passionate men and women that have built these uh, regionalized systems of care and find out in their own words how this happened, what they had to overcome to make that happen, and to film it uh, I, I feel like we've created some some truly timeless content, and uh, it's been it's been incredible uh, to to travel around the country and feature how this is happening. It's it's a passionate topic for me anyway, uh, and so uh, to to kind of uh, combine the uh, Ted Setlist talents and Chris Eldridge, um, who is a, a very uh, talented uh, cameraman, um, and to be able to go around the country and, and just learn about these systems and be able to tell the story with such excellent production values has been a, a real pleasure. So I'd like to do more things like that. I love that. I, I love telling our story that way. Yeah. Well, Tom, thank you for joining us. Sure. And, um, I, I'm so pleased to have you in the family of EMS right. 10. And That's I'm right. so excited. Yeah. Uh, I'm Chris Montera, and thanks for joining us at the EMS 10 2011 Awards.